the dress. I'm so busy right now. Eat breakfast, baby. Please, please, why are you loud? You can make it like, you can fit. Please. Baby, please, I can't do it right now. I'm very busy. I promise you we'll do it later. Yeah, that video really does uh, show what a lot of us are feeling. I know, you know, I'm a dad and I've got two kids and though my daughter's in high school, uh, you know, a lot of those small moments are gone and you're so busy at that time. It's just a really difficult time for, for all parents, right? All right, so here we go. Do you feel too busy? I know I've felt that way before. We've all got so much going on right now in today's societies. And we feel torn between all the responsibilities that we have in all these different areas. And it's like our society is just wired for this, I don't know, barely keep your heads above water kind of mentality that we've all found ourselves in. And, you know, things like, for instance, work deadlines, right? Then you got to work overtime because you got to pay the bills. You've got school, you've got homework. You've got church and sports activities, doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, and then, you know, your car breaks down, your house, something needs repaired on your house, and laundry, it never stops, never, ever, ever stops. And just when you think, all right, I think I got this, I'm, 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 I'm on top of the wheel instead of being rolled over by it, at, at that moment right there, oh, then the... School system says, oh, today is a special spirit day or tomorrow and you got its tie dye day at the school. So you stay up till 1130 making some project or doing something for tie dye day. It's not easy to be intentional right now about about raising kids and uh, and putting that focus on that next generation. So this is part three of our sermon series called Family Values. And in this series, we've been talking about parenting and marriage and forgiveness and relationships and how all those dynamics work and how important they are, specifically in our, in our families. And today, we're going to discover some tips, how we can raise loving, caring young people and turn them into fruitful, God-loving uh, adults. That's really the goal, is to have them be productive adults that love the Lord. Now, if you don't have kids or grandkids, you could be thinking right now, I don't know, this, this message isn't for me. No, 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 no. Now more than ever, young people need good Christians, people that have God in their life to get beside them and walk beside them and, and go through life with them and help them navigate all the weird stuff that's happening around them right now. But listen, here's some hard truth. Over the years, Church of the Heartland, we've done many different parenting groups or classes and different kind of ministries to help uh, parents, young parents, or even grandparents be, be more fruitful in this you know, endeavor of intentionally bringing up kids. But let me just say, and I, I'm, I'm sad to say, it is just about the least attended thing we've always ever done. It seems like, for some reason, um, people don't want this information or they don't think they need this information. And anytime we talk about these things, uh, stuff sometimes gets weird. And then people think, well, my kids are already grown, so I don't need to think about this. Or, or what, what does this have to do with me? Or 
you know, some some idea that, well, the knowledge is just going to come to me and I don't need to research it or know these things. Um, sometimes we even defend every action that our kids might do. Every single thing they do or don't do, we just defend that thing or the, or the exact opposite. We don't, we're somehow frustrated with these kids and we don't ever show them the love and respect that they need. But all that to say, can we all agree that if we were to change our culture, our society, American society, if we were to change how we brought up our children, we could really do the most good, the most transformative thing for American culture right there in that parenting. That if we focus on that and put God and the right things and the right tools and the right productivity, we put that in the hearts of this next generation, that's what they're going to need to be a success. So let's agree that putting these things in their hearts is critically important, right? We can all agree on that. And let me just also add, there are some parents that maybe didn't do all that good a job, I'm not sure how to say it, and their kids didn't turn out great. And there are other parents who did it exactly, they're supposed to do it, and their kids went astray. Listen, that that is just how life works. So no matter what, we're gonna just try to look at some things that help us to, to put these things in the next generation, and then we're gonna leave this in the hands of the Lord. Now the scripture we're going to today is in the book of Psalms. And this is at a time where uh, about 20, uh, about 3,000 years ago, the King David, and the nation needs to get back at this point, back to what it used to be and remember who they were and what God had done for them. And so we're going to go to uh, Psalm 78 today and we're going to start in verse one. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach your hidden, I teach you hidden lessons from our past, things that, that are hidden. This is like a hidden knowledge that we need to be uh, teaching. Stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. Okay, those things, the, the, from valuable things from God in the past, we will, we're not gonna hide these things. No, what does verse four, uh, four say? We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. We're gonna, we're gonna explain what God's done to this next generation. We're not gonna hide things from them. We're gonna teach them. And then uh, verse five, for he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors so the next generation might know them. So the ones, the next generation coming up might know who God is, what the, what the rules are, and how to best navigate life. Even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So it's being handed down. So each generation should set, should set its hope anew on God. Every, every generation needs to look towards the Lord, not forgetting his glorious miracles, and obeying his commands. Then, verse eight, then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. If we take what God has said and we keep handing those things down, then it, it makes the next generation not stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful. So by putting the right things into the hearts of the next generation, we set them up to be a success, to, to have victory in their lives, and, and to overcome. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in these verses. Let's start with this. God has a lot to say about raising children. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. We live in a culture right now that thinks it knows everything. It's got all the knowledge. It's the, we're the greatest in, in, in all ways of, of all time. And there's no one's ever done it as good as we are doing it. That may be true in some things, but I don't think that's true with everything. I think there are hidden secrets from the past that God placed in there that can help us to raise our family in these trying times. God's ways of raising our family families is not common knowledge right now. It's not understood now. Oh, well, everybody knows how to. No, we don't. Most American parents don't see God's ways 
as the best ways to live or the best things to hand down into the hearts of children. They might even think that, oh, those, those ways are old fashioned. Nobody does it like that anymore. We don't need that. That's out of date. But God's truth is always timeless truth. It's, it's the truth from the beginning to the end for all humanity. It doesn't come and go as the different generations come and go. It's timeless. God's word is the solid foundation that stands the test of time. And so what do we need to do? We need to have spiritual ears to hear what God is saying to us today. It may sound like something that you'd expect a preacher to say, right? Oh, yeah, have spiritual ears. No, no, no. Let's have spiritual ears. Let's really stop and pray and listen to God and hear what he wants and how he wants us to parent our kids and what he wants for us to put in the hearts of our children. The Bible has a lot to say about these things. So we gotta be diving into the word of God every single day, reading the Bible every single day so we know what to do and how to navigate the difficult situations we found ourselves in. Now, I do believe today's the day that we reassess our parenting approach. We need to go back through it. Now, I know for all of us, it was the way we were raised and it's what we know and it's all we know. That doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Some of those things might be from God. Some of those things might not be from God. So let's do this. Let's just all say, okay, here we go. We're gonna be intentional about this and we are going to purposefully get things from God that, and, and let God show us how to approach this next generation and what he wants us to put into their hearts. See, there was a young mom at soccer practice. Okay, so a few years ago, a young mom was at soccer practice and the kids were told to run laps around the field and then make their way back to the center each time. So it was like this kind of a, a version of a lap around the field. And the first kids, of course, the first lap or two, you're, they did it right. Uh, but it didn't take long for the kids to quickly start cutting those edges off and, and cutting around the edges, rounding off the edges. And every time they rounded them off, they round them off a little more and a little more. And so it's not a rectangle they're running anymore. It's more like an oval and then maybe like a circle. This young mom's son began to do what all the other kids were doing. She's sitting there at the practice. She sees her son rounding off these corners and she yells out, all the way to the corner, do it right. We are not cheaters. One of the kid's fathers looked at her and said, geez, it's only like six feet that they're cutting off. And the young mom didn't say anything at the time, but his comments stuck with her. She wondered to herself, would you cut, cut six feet off of a wall if you're building a house? No. You're gonna do your best to build that house exactly to the blueprint. You aren't gonna say, oh well, this board is six feet short and too bad, well, we'll just use it anyway. No, you're gonna get a brand new board. Why? Because cutting corners on the home causes structural integrity issues. And every corner that's cut ends up being something that puts the house in jeopardy later. Cutting corners is the same way in the area of parenting. We cause structural integrity issues in our children when we cut corners all the time. See, young people need strong family values. They need the right concrete poured into their lives. They need firm foundations. They need to be taught. This is how we do things right. This is what we do. We don't cut corners. And even if no one else is doing it right, doesn't matter. This is how we do it. Why? Because this generation that's coming up is going to be facing storms and situations that you and I probably can't even imagine. And they're going to be going through some stuff that, that and have to lead their families through some stuff that is probably beyond our comprehension. But if we teach them the right things, put the right concrete in their lives, show them the ways of God, the hidden secrets from the Lord, when we do that, Guys, then they'll be able to not just succeed in their own hearts or lives, but they'll be passing those things on into those next generations. You see, God thinks generationally, and so should we. Now, Acts 7.32 says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that saying alone, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are some Old Testament 
uh, actually book of Genesis, Old Testament characters. And God explained himself that way many times, even to Moses. And we see through the Bible, at least a dozen times, God shares that saying with, with his people in the Old and the New Testament. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, Abraham was the son of Isaac, and Isaac was, a, had his, was you know, there are three generations. Abraham had a son, Isaac, Isaac had a son, Jacob. And so it's, you're seeing a generational mentality here. And there's, it, 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 look at it this way. With the three generations, there's someone above us and there's someone below us. That's the idea. That's the concept God wants us to get. God thinks generationally. He is, he is thinking way further out. Of course, he sees all time and space. But, I mean, he's thinking way further out time-wise than you and I could even ever imagine. We tend to think like one day at a time. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But God is thinking on a level that is just way, way out there. He's thinking generationally. He's thinking legacy. He's thinking dynasty. And we're thinking just piece by piece, moment by moment type stuff. Well, that's okay. But the more we can get up and see things from God's eternal perspective, the better we are. Start thinking generationally. All right, what am I getting from this other generation? And then handing down to this generation. What, what, what things need to be coming from, <laughs> maybe there is something coming from this generation that needs to be pruned, and I'm going to put the right things in my children, even if you didn't have good parents or grandparents. Okay, well, maybe you didn't, but you can say, okay, for me, I'm going to say, I like these things, I don't like those things, I'm going to put this into my children. All right, look at these generations that are now alive. We have the current generations alive right now. We've got the great generation born from 1928 to 1945, the baby boomers from 1945 to 1964, the Gen X, that's me, uh, we were born from 65 to 80, the millennials, born from 81 to 96, and then Gen Z, 97 to, we're not sure quite yet. See, we're in a strange place in human history right now to have five generations alive on earth that really has never been done before. That's, we've pushed the limits with modern science and medicine. We've pushed the limits of, of how, uh, how many generations are alive at a time. And that has made things a little uncomfortable in our world. It's like a three-bedroom house that has five families living in it, right? Everybody's kind of crammed on each other. We have five generations in this world right now that was supposed to be a three-generation <laughs> or so world. We have five generations living. Okay, so this house feels like this. We built a nice apartment out back for the silent generation and uh, the great generation. The baby boomers, they still own the house. The Gen X is living in the basement and still trying to wake up the millennials because it's 1030 and they're still sleeping. And then we trying to everybody's trying to get Gen Z to go to bed at night and not stay up all night playing Fortnite. So that's kind of how it feels, right? We're all kind of on top of, on top of each other. Each of these generations was raised in very different ways and at very different times, and with very different values even. See, for the older generation, the pace was slower, and our shared faith was important, and there was a high moral standard, and doing things right, and how to do things right. But with that, sadly, came a Pharisee spirit that is not what God intended at all. And for the younger generations, life is frantic. We have a 47, on average, a 47-hour work week. Faith is pushed to the bottom of the list of priorities. For these younger generations, trust has been broken. They distrust everything. And moral tolerance has a brand new definition. Tolerance originally meant the idea that all people have equal value, which is good. That's what the Bible says. But it's subtly changed to mean that all ideas have equal value. And this has led to young people believing that if you come against their idea, that you're devaluing them as a person, which is not the case. So there are some things that need adjusted here in, in how we live in this place with these five generations. There's a famous cultural anthropologist in the 1960s. Her name was Margaret Mead. And uh, here's a quote from her. Throughout human history, this is from the 60s, remember. Throughout human history, in all cultures, parents and grandparents have helped their young understand life in the future. 
However, I anticipate that a time is coming when technology and culture change so fast that children will have to figure out for themselves what their values will be. Okay, that was written in the 60s and we are seeing that today. Things are moving so fast. Technology is moving so fast. Cultural values moving so fast. So these younger generations, they need the older generations to help them filter through what is out there. If everybody's just crying, everybody, you know, every, my truth is the truth, my truth is the truth, my truth. Well, what one's the truth? And when they need those older generations to speak into their lives and, and show them and guide them um, and, and give them thoughtful direction of, of where to go and what to do and what to value. And all of this, guys, right, is really overwhelming. <laughs> it's how it feels, right? But God has given us an answer. And here it is. We need to get things from God and then pass them on. Verse 4, we will not hide these truths from our children. Get things in our hearts from the Lord and then pass them on to the next generation. These could be things that God taught us from the Bible, things that we got in prayer, something from God that your parents or grandparents taught you and you're putting that into the heart of the next generation. If we, if we start with this process, it really has a cascading effect down into the, the next generation. We start with our own hearts and we say, okay, God, fill my heart with, with the right things. Give me something to share with this next generation. Help me have a conversation with my kids or my grandkids. Help me, Lord, to, to navigate. Help, them, help me, Lord, to know how to help them navigate the world that they live in. I pray that God gives every single one of us a deep passion for this, a passion to put in the right things into that next generation and really put the right concrete into them. And guys, maybe this is, this is new to you and maybe you're new to even serving the Lord. Listen, okay, you still got things that God's placed in your life that you can put into the heart of that next generation. And we can all, no matter how old we are or where our background is, we can all begin to receive something from God and have spiritual ears to hear and then begin to place that into the hearts of the next generation. You might even be thinking, I've made too many mistakes. I don't, I don't have anything to give. No, 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 no. What if we told our story? What if you told your story to that next generation? And you, you told them, here's even some mistakes I've made. I'm still telling you these things so you have the right mentalities and the right outlook so you don't make said mistakes. One way we can help this next generation is by asking them some deeper questions. What is the truth? What do you believe truth is? What do you, what do you believe? Why do you believe it? Where are you going? A lot of times I love to ask next generation, you know, teenagers or 20 year olds, where are you going? What are you doing? What's in your heart? What dream do you have in your heart? And then they'll go, da, da, da. well, what steps are you taking to accomplish that dream? Well, I don't know. But I mean, we got to get them thinking beyond just the moment by moment stuff. And we've got to think generationally and we need to put that in their hearts too. I'll we'll take a few minutes here and just talk specifically to fathers. Your role is so critical in the spiritual household that God's creating. God wants us fathers to be the spiritual leaders of our home. And I know that's not the case in many situations. It's like seen as, oh, I don't know, men don't do that kind of stuff. That's, that's uh, I don't know, stuff that's sissy stuff to be a man of God. That's not the case at all. Show your family what it means to be a man of God. Model it. Model it. Let your family see you reading the Bible, see you praying. Because check out these facts. If a family member comes to Christ, the influence they have over the rest of their family is this. There's the wife, when she comes to Jesus, she has an 18% influence over her children and her family. When the kids come to Jesus, they have a 22% influence over the rest of their family's spiritual dynamic. When a father, when a dad comes to Jesus, they have a 94% influence over their family and the family's spiritual dynamic. Guys, that's a lot of influence. It's huge. When dads, when we get things from God and start putting that into the next generation, there is something very special about that. Tell your family how you met your wife. Tell your family 
what God's doing in your life. Create environments for this next generation to grow. Create peaceful, spiritual homes that even when you disagree, you disagree properly. It's an open place where real conversations can take place, where people listen to each other. They speak their minds, but they do it with patience and, and grace. I know it's easy to feel tired and overwhelmed, but don't give up. Do not quit. I promise you, you are making a difference. And, and, and all the things that we do, when we are strategic about it and we're doing these things intentionally, we are really making a difference in that next generation. One, one other thought here. We all have to be teachable in this area. Parenting is a skill like any other skill. And we need to learn it. I can't tell you how many times I've counseled somebody and I've, and I've said, okay, so we've got a, a parenting issue and your children are not listening or whatever it is. And I say, what, what books have you read about parenting? None. What podcasts have you listened about parenting? None. What uh, what what have you, have you what what are we doing? Well, we, we're basically coming to you, Heath. Well, that's good, but but man, there's so much great knowledge and information out there. Get that skill in your own life. It makes a difference. There are all kinds of great resources, free resources, that really can help us to sharpen our parenting skills. All right, now you might have kids that are grown. And you think, well, this is not really applying to me. No, no. Our job for all generations is to get something from God and put it into the hearts of the next generation. With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was some years where Abraham and Jacob were alive. Abraham had the ability together. Abraham was putting things in his, his grandchildren, his ch children and his grandchildren. He's speaking the word. He's getting things from God and putting it into their lives. So find a young family that you can get beside and, and walk with. Maybe serve in one of our next generation ministries at our church. Take some time to impart into those grandkids. Have some conversations. Pierce the, the, the hard shell there and let's really open up and talk. I guess no matter what we do, let's all be strategic about it. Let's do it on purpose. Because we've all had people that have made a difference in our lives, right? I remember back growing up, so many wonderful people made a difference in the direction my life was going. Of course, my parents, I love them so much. They, what they put in my life, how they live for God, not perfect, they're not perfect, they're humans, but they really did the right stuff, the most important things right. They were always an example of putting God first in my life. I had a great youth pastor, Danny Ringan, made a big difference in my life, great conversations with him. Uh, my, my early 20s, you know, I started a relationship, a mentor relationship with Pastor Mark Royer, who is my mentor and pastor to this day. And, and the, the times that he's helped me and guided me and, and helped me navigate through all kinds of situations that he's been through, it's just beyond valuable. I'll think it back when I was a kid, I had times when I was just a little guy and some other church family was there and they were thinking and guiding and, and helping and, and teaching me the Word of God in kids' ministries. My own grandparents, both sets of grandparents, went to church, loved God, loved their families, built the right foundations, con poured the concrete in there. Those little conversations we had, those are priceless. And all those things, it's, it's really all those people doing a little bit to, to help my life get to, to where I'm at. And I'm so thankful for them. And that's what God's calling every one of us to do into the hearts of, of, of this next generation. Or maybe you're a member of the younger generation. God's calling you to tap into the wisdom of the older generations. Ask them, how would you navigate life if you were me right now? What would you do in this situation? And tap into that wisdom and knowledge. When we do that, guys, we are really going to get to where God wants us to be. So how do we apply this to our lives? A couple things. First, have a generational mentality. Put it in our heads right now. We are generational. We've got one below us. We've got one beside us. And we've got one above us. And there's the, the different dynamic, how we're going to relate to each one of those. We need to be tapping into the one above us, getting their wisdom, helping the ones beside us, and then pouring into the ones below us. Also, get something from God and put it into the hearts of the next generation. When God gives you a scripture that means something to you, 
text that scripture to your kids or grandkids. You know, when God gives you some information or something in prayer about them, put that into their hearts. When God leads you to have a conversation with them, man, it might not even be an easy one. Have that conversation. Really get something from God, obey God, listen to God, and then put that into the hearts of the next generation. Let's have a moment of prayer, a word of prayer together. Lord, I pray right now that you help all of us have a generational mentality. Lord, I know in my own life as a dad, I've not done it perfectly. And, and I, on behalf of all of us, Lord, help us and to overcome all the mistakes that we've made in the times when we've been parents. And help us to be better. Help us to have spiritual ears to hear what you, what Lord, you are speaking to us and how we can put the right things into this next generation. Lord, I pray also that we have a heart that's teachable to learn from you and other resources, tap into that older generation so we can navigate this difficult time we found ourselves in. And Lord, for many people, their kids are grown or, or maybe that's something that they were, were looking for. I pray that you lead them and show them how they can be a part of changing that next generation and what their part really is. We have spiritual ears to hear, Lord. Speak. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.